All right, you guys, welcome to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. If this is your first time to the channel here, welcome. If not, welcome back. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson. Now, my whole goal in creating this YouTube channel, ICU Advantage, was to try and bring you guys some of the best online and really free critical care educational content out there. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that for you guys, and if you'd be interested in getting more of this critical care content, then please subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications, that way you'll never miss out when I release a new lesson. Alright, so for this lesson, this is a sixth lesson in the CRT Explain series, and in this lesson we're going to be talking about the pearls of therapy. I'm basically just going to be rambling through some pearls that I've learned over the years, or just some common things that come up when running CRT therapy. Now this isn't going to be an exhaustive troubleshooting list, and I'm sure I'm going to miss some things later that I wish I included, but hopefully this contains some good information for you guys. So first let's talk about our access and return issues. And this is probably the biggest headache of running CRT. If you're having access or return line issues, it's really going to make for a really annoying and sometimes awful shift. Now unfortunately this is probably something that you guys are going to come across. I definitely can recall many nightmares of just having constant issues on getting CRT to run on patients. And really what I'm talking about here is when we have our access, which is going to be too negative, or our return, which is going to be too positive. Now if these are too high, then these are going to red alarm on the machine, and the system is going to stop not only just the therapy, but also the blood flow. So it's going to be really important that you guys fix this quickly. Now with this, we do want to avoid flipping lines. So Typically, we have the red to the red and the blue to the blue on the catheter, and the flipping is where you basically switch that. You have red to blue and blue to red. And the reason for this is this is actually going to decrease the effectiveness of the therapy. If you remember in that second lesson where I talked about where those ports are on the dialysis catheter, we want to ideally be pulling the blood from the, the proximal port and then returning the blood to the distal port. Now, if it certainly comes to a matter of running or not running, then absolutely we'll flip those lines in order to keep the therapy going. But just remember that we're losing efficiency now by having those lines flipped. Patient positioning can sometimes be the cause of the issues that we have here. So if you have your line in the patient's IJ, make sure you're checking their upper body position, position of the limb, uh, as well as their head and neck. If we have femoral access, then make sure we're checking lower body position, making sure that the leg is not bent, and there's really nothing pressing on the line. When having these issues, sometimes a good couple flushes can do the trick. And really speaking of flushes, also make sure that you guys are flushing the lines good when you're disconnecting or doing a filter change. Our goal is to really keep that line functioning good. Now some places still pack these lines with heparin or citrate, so make sure that you guys know what your facility process is. If you do pack or you're unsure if you do, then you really need to make sure that you're withdrawing this and that you're not flushing this into the patient. And really at the end of the day, if all else has failed, it's really vital that our patient is getting this therapy. If you need to advocate for a new line and perhaps a new location of that line, make sure you guys do so. All right, so now let's talk about clotting versus clogging. And really when we're talking about this terminology, we're talking about two primarily different things. We have our transmembrane pressure or our TMP and our pressure drop. Now our TMP is basically the hydrostatic pressure across the membrane. Now this is a difference in pressure between the blood and the dialysate compartment. To really simply think about this, this is the amount of pressure required, that hydrostatic pressure, to move fluid from the blood across that membrane into the di dialysate. This is the driving factor for our convection. And some of the settings on the machine are actually going to change this TMP value, so if we're adjusting blood flow rate, the patient fluid removal rate, as well as the replacement solution rate, these are all going to impact our TMP. Now if we hit a positive pressure of 350, this is going to trigger an alert, and if we go above a positive pressure of 450, this is typically going to trigger the alarm. And this increasing TMP is what's going to be measuring that our filter is clogging. So you can really think about it as the filter begins to clog, those pores that are in the membrane that allow the water and solutes to cross are going to begin to get filled up with junk. The more of these that are filled up or the more restrictive that they become, it's going to require more and more pressure in order to move that fluid across there. Hence, as the filter is clogging, you're going to see this going up and up and up. Now, our pressure drop is a measure of the pressure required to go through the filter. So you can really think of this as the change in pressure of blood entering and then leaving the filter. 
And here, as we adjust the blood flow rate, that this is going to impact the pressure drop. The higher the blood flow rate, the higher the pressure is going to be initially going into that filter. Once this value reaches 200 or higher, that this is what's going to trigger the alarm. And then this is going to be our indicator for the filter is clotting. So again, you can think about, remember in the filter, we have those really tiny hair-like hollow fiber membranes, and the blood is flowing inside of those tiny fibers. As they eventually begin to clot off, it's going to be harder and harder in order to move the blood through there, leading to a higher and higher pressure drop. All right, now let's talk about our prescribed versus our delivered therapy dosing. Now, while we as nurses do not directly control the rates of therapy, we can and do have significant impact on what is actually delivered versus what is prescribed. According to many different studies that have taken place, the generally accepted delivered dose goal is going to be 20 to 25 milliliters per kilogram per hour. And really, our surrogate for this delivered dose is going to be our affluent rate. Now this dose along with the prescribed dose is going to be shown on the machine and this is really why we enter the patient's weight in here. And stoppages in therapy happen frequently and are oftentimes unavoidable. Things like simple bag changes will stop the therapy until that bag is changed. The quicker we can detect this and complete these tasks, the less downtime that we're going to have. Also, a multitude of alarms will either stop therapy or even stop blood flow completely. So it's really important to be on the listen for these alarms and work to correct them quickly. Now, access and return line issues like we just talked about can really lead to significant reduction in the therapy that's being delivered, depending on how much trouble your line is giving you. And so we can really do our part to minimize these disruptions in therapy. Interventions we do directly impact this. If you notice that your delivered dose is below the 20 to 25 mils per kg per hour, then you should really be alerting the provider to see if they need to increase the prescribed dose to make up for any of the issues that we're having so that at the end of the day, we end up back within that actual delivered dose goal of 20 to 25. Next, we have our blood return. And there's generally around 150 to 165 milliliters of blood in the CRT filter set, depending which filter set you're using and which machine. So it's really important that we're able to get this blood returned to the patient before our filter completely clots and we're, not, we're unable to do so. And if it's not returned, this is really equivalent to about a quarter of a unit of whole blood. If we're having frequent filter changes that are happening and the blood is not being returned, this can obviously lead to the patient having pretty significant blood loss and ultimately requiring transfusion. So in order to return this blood to the patient before the filter either clots or clogs off, what we do is we stop the therapy, we disconnect the access line from the patient, making sure that we flush the access line of the dialysis catheter good, and then we're going to attach that access line to a bag of fluids. Then as we go through the process of returning the blood, basically we're going to be filtering this fluid from the access all the way up in through the filter and then back through the return line to the patient, really returning a majority of the blood to the patient. Of course, it's important that we're closely monitoring during this time for any clots or how the patient is really tolerating this. Another important thing to talk about is pre-priming a filter set. So this is essentially when you get the machine and the filter all primed ready to go, but your patient's not there in order to hook right up to. In these cases, it's really important that you don't pre-prime this filter set and leave it sitting for too long. Doing this can actually lead to a reaction in your patient potentially when hooking them up and starting the therapy. So really our best practice is to prime when you're ready to hook up to the patient. Now a crucial part of CRT therapy is going to be the precise management of our patient's fluid balance. And this is going to be through managing our patient's ins and outs or our I's and O's. Every hour we're going to be meticulously adding and subtracting and figuring out what our balance is. And oftentimes we're chasing the hour that just happened. And what I mean by that is we're figuring out where our fluid balance was for the past hour and then adjusting the patient fluid removal rate on the machine to ensure that we're having the proper balance that's being ordered by the provider. And so it's really important that you don't miss anything. You've got to make sure that you're thinking of all the flushes that you do, any drains that they might have. Make sure you include all of those. Now, in order to get the most accurate volume that's infused through the pumps, if you have the ability to do so, make sure you pull that exact volume that's infused. A lot of the pumps are able to go in there and look at how much volume has actually been given and then reset that number so that way when you do your next check in an hour, you'll have the exact volume that was given. 
Now, some caveats to this are going to be if you're giving someone fluid or albumin for hypotension, please don't pull that fluid back off. The whole point of giving them that fluid is to give them the volume that they might need, and if you pull it right back off through the CRT, you're basically nullifying what you just did. And the same goes for blood or FFP, again, if you're giving it to your patient because they're hypotensive as a result of that. If you're just giving them a standard transfusion because they're having hemoglobin drift, then it's okay to pull that volume off for the, the blood that you've given at that point. Now, if you're having to change your filter, it's really important that you get the actual volume of fluid that was removed from your patient before you begin the process. This way you can accurately calculate how much fluid your patient was positive during the time that the filter was down. Now, if the therapy is going to be down for an extended time, don't try and make up all that fluid in one hour. Try to spread that out over a couple hours. And then probably most importantly is every hour you want to figure out whether you were over or under your set fluid removal rate. So did you pull more or less fluid than you were supposed to? You want to then figure out what that difference is and either add or subtract that to the next hour. This is really important because if you're short pulling fluid 10 to 20 milliliters an hour for an entire day, that that's really going to add up. Now what if you have a crashing patient? Now if your patient's going down, and your therapy is ordered to be pulling fluid and running your patient negative, stop pulling that additional fluid. Now, if things are continuing to deteriorate and your patient is near coding, then at this point you might want to just stop all the fluid removal until you say, see which way things are going to go. Now, oftentimes these very sick patients are getting large volumes of fluid with the drips that they're getting, so obviously we don't want to do this for very long, but doing this can be a quick code prevention in the moment. Now, speaking of codes, if your patient does actually code, then you want to turn your blood flow down as low as it goes. And really, as soon as you get the chance, you want to return that blood. Because really, compressions and CRT running smoothly do not go together. The last thing you want while your patient is coding is to be constantly dealing with the CRT alarming. Now, in the last lesson, we talked about the anticoagulation strategies for CRT, so I do want to talk a little bit more here just about some pearls for our citrate anticoagulation. So it's going to be important that you ensure that you're using dialysate and replacement solution with no calcium in there. The calcium that's in the normal premixed bags can bind the citrate, basically making it less effective. Now, if you're using a hypertonic citrate solution, such as trisodium citrate, close monitoring of our patient's sodium level is also going to be important. These solutions can actually lead to hypernatremia in our patient, and if they do become hypernatremic, you're going to need to reduce the sodium that's in either the dialysate or the replacement fluid. Now, in my facility, when this becomes necessary, we have a protocol to basically switch between normal saline, half-normal saline, and D5W as our replacement fluid based on where our patient's sodium level is. Now, the other important thing here is when you're starting or stopping your therapy, it's absolutely vital that the citrate and the calcium infusion are stopped and started together. Don't ever run one without the other, even just for a little bit. Now, always make sure that you have a hand crank with your machine. The last thing you want is the machine to die and you have no way to return the blood that's in there. Now, because we're extracorporeally filtering the blood, hypothermia is a common concern. Both blood and fluid warmers are often used, and sometimes though this is not enough and a warming blanket or some sort of warming machine is also going to be needed. Now, knowing this though, it's important to know that CRT has a way of actually masking fevers. If you're finding that your patient is normal thermic without any sort of warming device, I'd be worried that your patient is actually febrile underneath. Also, don't sit on bag changes or effluent bag empties. In this state here, the blood pump is still running, but the therapy is not. And the same goes for clearing alarms. The yellow alarm could mean that therapy is not running for your patient. Now let's talk about the blood leak detector or the BLD. Now this part can be finicky, especially when it's not cleaned properly. You want to take an alcohol swab to this between runs. The effluent coming from your patient should be either clear or yellow. If you do get the BLD alarm on your machine, or you think that you see pink in the effluent bag, that this could mean that you have a ruptured membrane. Send a sample of the effluent to the lab to check for blood, and change the set if it is detected. Now, word to the wise, don't forget to clamp the syringe tube line if you're not using it for the CRT machine. And along those lines, always check the connectors, especially on a new set. I've personally had the Y connector come off during priming. Also really important, never use an old affluent bag when you're priming a new set. 
Remember that we're attaching that return line to this bag for the priming process and then disconnecting from there and attaching to the patient. This is a major no-go. And then lastly, if you're having to put up a new filter set when you've been already running, you don't have to use new full bags of replacement and dialysate when you're putting that new setup. Don't waste those old fluids. Just make sure and cap off the ends while you're putting the new set in place and then put those same used bags back on the scales with the new filter. The machine is pretty smart like that and it's gonna be able to figure out how much fluid you have. All right, so those are the main pearls that I wanted to just kind of talk to you guys about that sort of came up while I was making the lessons for the last few lessons here. And I really wanted to kind of share some of this information with you guys because again, like anything else that we do, so much of the experience that we gain is really through just doing things over and over and coming across new things or learning from those who came before us. So my goal here was to sort of share some of the things that I have learned over the years to hopefully give you guys some good information to be able to carry that forward and caring for your own patients. So I really hope that you guys enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please go down below, hit that like button. Uh, it really goes a long way in helping to support this channel and helping it get discovered, as well as sharing this video with other people who might find this beneficial as well. Feel free to leave me a comment down in the comment section down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave and questions that you ask, and I try to respond to every single person who leaves one. Also, a special shout out to our awesome YouTube members and Patreon members. The support that you guys offer really goes a long way in helping me to do bigger and better things for this channel going into the future. So a big thank you to you guys. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can either join as a YouTube member down below or head over to the Patreon page and check out some of the additional perks that you get for becoming a member as well as showing support for this channel. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel down below. That way you don't miss out on the, the next lesson that I release here. Otherwise, in the meantime, make sure and check out a couple really awesome lessons that I link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.